All right, I think it's about that time. Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to NDD's webinar titled Expanding on Spirometry with DLCO. My name is Jamie Burgess, and I'm an RT with NDD. And my name is Darren Fitzpatrick, and I'm also an RT with NDD. And today we're excited to have Professor Dr. Robert Jensen, Department of Medicine, the University of Utah Pulmonary Division, who, who is also a part of the a member of the ATS ERS Committee to Establish Pulmonary Function Testing Standard. That's a long one with us today. So thank you, Dr. Jensen, for joining us on this call. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We just wanted to take an extra moment to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, if this is not your first webinar with us, you'll notice we are a little more spread out than usual. Um, I kind of miss having Darren here with me in person, <laughs> but we're doing what we can um, just to social distance and do our part. Um, we know that so many of you all are physicians, providers, uh, respiratory therapists, and other crucial support staff that are involved in the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The work that you guys are doing is so important. We understand the risks that you guys are placing yourself in day in and day out um, just to care for your patients. Um, NDD, as well as Darren and myself as respiratory therapists, we would just want you guys all to know that we're here for you and that we're supporting you guys through this. So again, thank you for hopping on here with us today. Yes, thank you, everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Moving forward. All right, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so setup is a little bit different this time. Um, so for questions throughout the presentation, um, there's actually a couple of different options on your uh, control panel. And so we wanna make sure that as questions come up during the presentation, you guys have a place to ask those. And we're asking you guys to type your questions under the questions tab and make sure that when, because we all are in different locations this time, that you do send those questions to all. There's a couple of options just to send to the host or to send to all. But just so that everybody has visibility and we don't miss any of your questions, questions bar and then send to all. Um, we will address those at the end so that we can keep moving, but um, we want to make sure that you guys have a place to ask those questions. Um, there will also be a post-webinar email sent out um, from NDD with our contact information, Darren and myself, for those questions that might pop up later. And there will also be a recording of this presentation for you to go back and reference. So what are the objectives to this webinar? So first and foremost, we're going to have a question and answer session with Dr. Robert Jensen, and we're very excited um, to hear from him today. We're going to learn what a DLCO test is and what it measures. Um, we're going to review um, adding the added benefits of DLCO in testing. We're going to give you guys some resources you can explore to further understand disease states that are associated with increased or decreased DLCO. And we're also going to do a live demonstration of a DLCO test on the Easy One Pro device that you can see here next to me. Good deal, thanks, Jamie. Yeah. And again, we wanna welcome Dr. Robert Jensen. And we really wanted to get Dr. Jensen on the phone today to discuss a paper that was just recently published in CHEST of December 2019. And with that, um, the publication was done with COPD gene. And we just thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, get Dr. Robert Jensen on the phone to further discuss adding DLCO uh, to office-based testing or portable, te portable testing. So with that, Dr. Jensen, uh, in your work with COPD gene, you stated that started with spirometry and added DLCO. Why was that decision made to add DLCO to the COPD gene study? Um, in phase one, I, I don't think the funding was available to buy the DLCO units for all of the 22 sites of COPD gene. And uh, it became extremely evident uh, after phase one was even partly completed that uh, the scientific community was asking um, the question, what about gas transfer across the lungs in COPD patients? And we weren't measuring it, and there was a lot of pressure put on to uh, bring devices in for all the sites in phase two. Um, funding for that was uh, partly done from the COPD Foundation and others as well. Um, and we brought out uh, uh, units to every single site, and now it's being measured. Uh, it was measured in phase two, three, and now we're going into phase four. It'll be measured in, in phase four as well. But it's a critical measurement to understand the health of the lungs. Absolutely. And 
off going off that off of that statement that with that being made, uh, could you tell me tell us why DLCO should be used as a tool in assessing COPD? Obviously, we know the gas transfer is important, um, but could you uh, maybe describe more as to why DLCO should be used? Well, fundamentally, the the lung uh, ventilates, which is breathing the air in and out. Uh, which brings the higher oxygen levels into the alveolar surface area and allows uh, carbon dioxide to exchange out and then we exhale the air out. So ventilation, which is measured by spirometry, is one aspect of the lungs. Uh, the most critical aspect of the lungs is actually the transfer of the gases across the membrane and uh, measuring the ability of an individual's lungs to move gas across the membrane is critical to understanding the health of the lungs. Uh, in particular, in COPD, uh, we've long known that uh, DLCO is decreased uh, sometimes dramatically in these patients. Absolutely. And with those patients, obviously, spirometry and DLCO have been performed. But what does DLCO offer beyond spirometry and also radiography, which is also a step in COPD assessment? Uh, well, new radiographic uh, tools which measure uh, the percent of emphysema within an individual's lungs by looking at density throughout the lung in a, in a high-resolution CAT scan uh, have been associated with uh, uh, the higher the, the incidence of C COPD in these patients is usually associated with a lower uh, spirometry value and a lower DLCO value. But there isn't a complete um, uh, correlation between uh, COPD and measurements of the lung in D with DLCO and spirometry. And it turns out that DLCO appears to be a, a, an independent uh, predictor of a number of things. Most important, importantly, uh, uh, severe exacerbations of patients with DLCO and uh, severe exacerbations almost always will send a patient to the hospital for uh, an extended period of time to, to, to move through that uh, process. And um, DLCO appears to be a powerful predictor for uh, severe exacerbations in COPD subjects. Okay, so I mean that leads into our next question too. Is a part of your paper also discussed uh, that DLC, DLCO and spirometry are predictors of hospitalization? Can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Well, as it turns out that um, uh, spirometry alone will predict a certain amount of uh, exacerbation rate, um, and DLCO alone will predict a certain amount. Combined together, they turn out to be a rather powerful predictor for. Uh, severe exacerbations. And when both are below 50% predicted, we see an increased uh, rate of exacerbations of about 320% uh, in that group wow. that has uh, values that are both low. And in your opinion, uh, how would physicians benefit from adding DLCO to their practice before, especially in Going, everything going on right now, PFT labs are not as readily available for a physician that wants to take a deeper look into their patient's COPD or diagnose. So how would a physician benefit from adding DLCO to their practice? Uh, well, it, it really depends upon the physician. Clearly, pulmonologists use this as a uh, their standard tool for uh, assessing lung function, uh, usually in a hospital laboratory. Uh, in the primary care physicians, it has a number of, uh, of uses in terms of trying to differentiate between uh, shortness of breath, which is derived mostly from cardiac or mostly from pulmonary uh, origins. And uh, the DLCO, if normal and shortness of breath exists and normal spirometry would suggest uh, a very likely case that it's a cardiac disorder, whereas abnormal DLCO and spirometry would suggest that it's primary pulmonary disorder and helps uh, the primary care physicians uh, direct uh, care to the proper specialists and afterwards. Absolutely. And we have seen um, primary care adding DLCO uh, more frequently now, just due to also to the fact that the patient's there and in the office and being the front line of finding that diagnosis. And we'll go deep dive deeper into an actual DLCO test to see how um, simple those are to perform. But 
with referencing the DLC, uh, uh, the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide in assessment of COPD paper that was just published, do you anticipate more data on DLCO to be published in the future? Anything you can give us the insider on? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working with colleagues here in Salt Lake City right now. We've done a, a, a very detailed altitude uh, study with DLCO. Uh, and that actually uh, is, is showing a lot of very interesting data with both uh, COPD sub patients and normal subjects in the contrast. And uh, as far as the COPD gene study goes, uh, the data presented in, in the paper that we published a little while ago was related to a single measurement after on phase two. We're now uh, collating data for uh, between phase one and two and looking at changes in DLCO and how that will be predictive of uh, changes in mortality and morbidity in these COPD patients. In addition, um, the, the COPD group has submitted an abstract to the ATS, which will probably be available online that starts uh, looking at mortality and uh, its association with DLCO measurements, which is uh, should be very interesting for everybody. Absolutely, and I know um, there's probably many on this call that would love if their physicians would add DLCO testing, and you know these are definitely helpful points for a RT or a nurse um, or a clinician to take back to their physicians and explain, you know, this is something that is easily able to be done in the physician office, um, along with spirometry, and look for those things such as an increased risk of hospitalization that we were talking about is such an important factor right now, especially with COPD years. Well, you so, know, yeah. Yeah, it certainly helps, I think, primary care physicians be alerted to their COPD subjects who are at very high risk of extreme exacerbations and, uh, you know, uh, all the sequelae that fall from that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for jumping on this call with us today. And Dr. Robert Jensen is going to stay on the call with us. And again, we'll answer. I can see this questions coming through and um, there's a lot coming. <laughs> so we can definitely what we'll do is Jamie and I will go through uh, the next part of this presentation and then we'll come back and get all those questions going for Dr. Jensen. Does that work OK with you, Dr. Jensen? Yes, I'll just be here. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good. So I know most of you um, who are on this call understand DLCO, um, but we would just wanted to give a textbook definition out there if there are some people that are unclear exactly what it measures. Um, straight from a textbook, DLCO is a clinically useful test that provides a quantitative measure of gas transfer between the lungs to the blood, um, which complements spirometry in the evaluation and the management of patients with respiratory and or cardiac disease. And I'm going to discuss a little bit more as to why DLCO testing. And DLCO offers clinically important information beyond obtained from spirometry and radiography and should be considered in characterizing and managing patients with COPD. This is just what Dr. Jensen touched on, that mm -hmm. adding this is such an important factor, especially for the diagnosis and management of COPD patients. Uh, DLCO is one of the best correlates for, correlate, excuse me, for emphysema and COPD. A lower percent predicted DLCO is associated with an increased COPD morbidity. And not only is that important for the physician and nurses and RTs to know, but also for our patients. Our patients should know their DLCO numbers. And so definitely um, educating our patients on that as well. Severe impairments in DLCO are independently associated with increased rates of COPD exacerbations with a particularly strong association between DLCO and severe exacerbations requiring emergency department visit or hospitalization. Again, right now with everything going on, it's so important that we have those baseline spirometry and DLCO numbers for our COPD patients, that not only that we know it, that they know it, so we can help keep those hospitalizations down or exacerbations decreased. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, the the top the focus of this talk isn't necessarily um, interpreting DLCO results, but we wanted to be able to provide you guys with a good resource, something that you could go back to um, after this presentation's over and really dive in what what common conditions or disease uh, pathways are associated with a high or a low or even a normal um, DLCO um, 
and their spirometry results combined. Um, so what we've done is we have we have this chart here um, in the slide. You can absolutely go through line by line. Um, we're not gonna do that right now, but I wanna make sure you guys see um, this chart was taken direct from an article published with American Family Physician, and the link to that source is there at the bottom of the page. So absolutely use that as a resource tool to go back in and really look through all these different disease states and see how DLCO would be affected in each one of those. And so we wanted to provide you all with a live demonstration. And if you guys have been on our talks before, you've seen Jamie and I do this. Uh, but th we really wanted to get everyone the view of what DLCO test actually looks like. Some of us are familiar with it and some are not so much. So what we're going to do is Jamie's going to be the patient. And again, we're doing this remotely. Usually we're next to each other. <laughs> so um, we are going to do this together the best that we can. But we're, what we're going to do is most of the time when DLCOs are performed, we do a spirometry test first. And Jamie's already done a spirometry test. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the DLCO. All and go right. ahead, Jamie. So Jamie's going to make sure that she has her mouth completely around the mouthpiece and that she's just going to be doing some normal. Thank you, Jamie. I wasn't going to point that out. <laughs> but nose clip on, please. And right here in the top box, you can see that Jamie is performing some normal breathing. Just some simple tidal breaths is what we have the patient start with. Then we ask the patient to fully exhale. We want them to blow out all the way so they can exhale as much of the air in their lungs so they can inhale as much of the test gas as possible. Jamie right here, the device has shut. She's inhaling above this vital capacity line. This line will be different for every patient. And the countdown is going on. She's holding your breath, holding your breath, and fully exhaling. DLCO is a very simple test for patients to test, uh, te to be tested on. Many times we will get comments that say, that's much easier than spirometry. <laughs> And it is, but it gives us so much more information, again, of what Dr. Jensen had spoke about and the importance of that. And I'm just gonna take a minute to go over this test page. So again, right up here in the blue is what Jamie was doing. She was doing some normal breathing and she was gonna take a nice deep breath in over the dotted line. She's holding your breath, holding your breath, holding your breath and fully exhaling. Down below is where we'll see our parameters. This is where we're going to get the predicted, meaning based off the patient with the information we put on for the patient, that what they should be able to achieve, what the lower limits of normal are, the lowest they can be with being normal, and their actual result. As you can see with this patient, they have 120% predicted of DLCO. They're looking good. <laughs> so this is where we'll do that. We ATS recommends that our two tests are done four minutes apart. And right here under the start button, you can see that there is three minutes left to the next test. It's very important that two DLCO tests are done four minutes apart. And then up on the, ta on the top, we actually give a test grade. And that grade up here is a D right now because we've only done one. The goal is to get an A or B. Just much like spirometry, we have the same grading. So this is a very simple test to perform. It's easily done in the physician's office with mild, you know, stress to the patient. But again, we get all that information that Dr. Robert Jensen spoke about. So we right now are we are doing uh, WebEx demos. So if you guys have physicians that you say think that would this would be a great thing for them to see, Jamie and I and plus three others across the U.S. are offering these WebEx demos right now where they can see software um, testing just like this. Thanks, Jamie for being yeah absolutely Anna White. <laughs> anytime so there we go um what i wanted to go over another slide uh, again discussing the easy the ndd easy one pro dlco device and as you can see next to jamie it's portable it's compact it's on a cart it has the dlco gas on it it can go bedside it can go room mm -hmm. to room easily be stored in a storage closet or stored in the corner. It's very um, compact to use. It's simple to use with, uh, with the intuitive user interface, like you saw when Jamie was performing the test. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. It's easy, easily and accurately diagnosed using the ATS ERS interpretation tree, which on this slide you can see over on the left hand side, we have added that tree and this is on all of our reports. But this is something that 
you know, pulmonologists can do in their head, but for offices that might want to have this on the report, it does a nice job of highlighting down what ATS and ERS have put out as a way to use this for diagnosis. As you can see with spirometry, we get normal, restricted, or obstructed, but we actually get diagnosis once a DLCO is added. So this is where you can get emphysema, diagnose the difference between emphysema and asthma. It's a great tool to use, especially on our device. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no warm-up time. This is something you can easily just come in and turn on, just like a spirometer. And we have a five-point calibration check, so it is doing automatic calibrations before every single DLCO. It's not something that you need to come and do in the morning, but it's done for you, again, before every single test, which is nice to know that your device is working accurately prior to the patient setting up on it. So, Yeah, absolutely. So, I know that's a lot of information. Um, what are some of the things that we want to be the key takeaways from today? Um, we hope that you have a better understanding of the importance of DLCO in the management of COPD patients. Um, we wanted to provide you with resources um, to recognize what disease states are associated with um, increased or decreased DLCO. And we wanted you to understand how adding DLCO can be a benefit to your patients and to your facility. Again, we want to thank you so much for coming. Our contact information is right there, our email addresses. And of course, for more information on our devices or to get in touch with um, anyone else, uh, you can go to nddmed.com and information on all of these devices are there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of switch gears a little bit just so that I can see the questions and we will kind of start working through those. So please ask your questions or um, at this time in the question box and we'll go through them. There are some on there. Jamie, are you able to see them? I am. They're a little small. So yeah, I had to scroll work back on up getting to the top bigger. So I'm actually, Jamie, if you don't mind, I'll start. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'm scrolling up to the top, so I'll get there in a minute. So is DLCO affected by effort, Dr. Jensen? Um, yes. As it turns out, uh, any prior exercise to doing the test uh, can raise the DLCO. Apparently, uh, it opens up the capillary bed and uh, DLCO gas transfer is increased um, even for a short while after some even mild exercise. Absolutely. And when it comes to the effort on the test, and this was by Mario. And, hi, Mario. <laughs> um, so another thing is when uh, Jamie was performing the test, and Jamie, maybe we can go back to that software. Uh, yeah. We are, there's that vital capacity line that is taken from the patient's spirometry. And so the effort of that patient being able to perform that test to get above that vital capacity line is very important as well. So if, I don't know if you meant effort by like what Dr. Robert Jensen was talking about when it comes to exercise or effort of actually performing the test, but either way, yes, it can both be affected. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Jensen, this is a good, another good question for you. It's a topic. It says, is NHANES 3 used to predict patients' DLCO? Uh, DLCO wasn't measured in NHANES 3, so there are not prediction equations from NHANES 3. Uh, NHANES 4, I believe, has prediction equations for DLCO. And uh, NHANES is a particularly good reference set because it's a random selection of people from North America and maybe one of the best uh, even for representing Americans at this point in time. But as we all know, uh, our, everything's changing and so uh, reference equations change with time as population mix changes with time as well. Perfect. Jamie, did you get yours to work, your questions? It's it's just very tiny, so I apologize. So I'm, having a, I'm um, having a hard time. <laughs> Bianca, are you able to see the full questions? Because we're not. Um Hi Darren. Yep, I can I can um I can hear them. Do you want me to read a couple to you guys? Yeah, there's one yeah, that says I think it's important to cover the reimbursement on this. I can't see of the course. rest of it though. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Let me go through that right now. Let's take a look here. Um Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna start from the top. I have a question here from Carolina that states, what if you need to perform a post spirometry test? Do you do that prior to performing DLCO test? 
Dr. Jensen, do you recommend doing that after or giving the albuterol? Uh, I, I think the present recommendation is to do pre and post and then do the DLCO following both spirometry tests. Uh, there is a little debate that was to whether the uh, bronchodilator will uh, increase the DLCO, but uh, data doesn't seem to support any large changes in the measurement of DC, DLCO post bronchodilator. I do know that sometimes when we are training, Carolina, we have the patient perform spirometry, give the albuterol, perform the DLCO, and come back to the post. Just because, like what Dr. Jensen said, there's not a lot of papers that state that we're affecting the DLCO by doing that. So, but sometimes it also gives the patient time to let that albuterol kick in work so mm -hmm. perfect thank you um, I have another question here from for, uh, Virginia who says do you agree or disagree PFTs especially DLCO should be performed when patient as well uh, that's the recommendation from the ATS and ERS uh, you know especially upper respiratory uh, infections um, there's a number of um, contraindications you know, recent surgery, recent eye surgery, and so forth, and those recommendations are available, but uh, you should read through a list of uh, the recommendations for any uh, exclusions on doing the test. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have another question here from Scotty Adams, who says, do other DLCO devices require warm-up time? Uh, depends on the manufacturer. Some require uh, some significant warm up time and being, you know, upwards of an hour or so. Uh, and others uh, are very quick. The, the electronics are, are stable at startup. I think the key for warm up is uh, analyzers and electronics being stable. And uh, apparently the NDD device does these uh, many, many point calibrations just prior to every test. So just as the as the subject goes on and the test is initiated, there's a whole series of calibrations that are done. Um, so the the device is quite stable for every single test performed. Absolutely, and also, and I don't think we touched on this too. Um, the Easy One Pro was the device that was used is being used in the COPD gene study. Just the device that's right next to Jamie and everything you're seeing here. I don't think we touched on that. So yes, um, when it came to uh, doing DLCO in that study. Perfect. Um, another question here uh, from Jack. In a family practice, how would you determine which patients need a DLCO test? Uh, if you're considering spirometry, I think DLCO should also be considered almost always. Uh, it, it, you're trying to evaluate usually a shortness of breath and you want to try to get to as much information about that shortness of breath as possible. And spirometry can give you some information. The DLCO will give you considerably more. Absolutely. All right, guys, just looking through a few other questions here. All right, let's see. I think there was one that I, talked about yeah the reimbursement. I I was just gonna read that um, one yep. for you. I think it's important to cover reimbursement on this. The spirometry portion of the actual effort is the hard part. They were already doing spirometry. Why wouldn't they be doing DLCO? That's the golden question. That's, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's and Dr. Jensen can comment on it too, but it's pretty, it's like what he just spoke about. If spirometry is being performed, that's the indication to do DLCO as well. But I'll let you answer that, Bob, or Dr. Jensen. Um, well, as I said, you know, if you're, if you're trying to understand uh, a problem with shortness of breath or you're trying to, you know, be sure that you're dealing with only asthma, for example, uh, as opposed to other things that might be uh, bringing that symptom to light. Uh, I think by the time you're trying to understand that better, that you get half the story with ventilation, and I think you get maybe even the larger half by doing a DLCO, which looks like gas transport. Thank you. I see another one here from Kuhn Thomas, who says, we are very comfortable with NDD's DL platform for the last five years. How do we convince our pulmonary consultants that this is not a, quote, Mickey Mouse, unquote, test? 
<laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, uh, the COPD gene study, which could have purchased and used any device uh, that's manufactured, uh, selected this one, and uh, they're now looking to, you know, go. I mean, some of these devices are out there 10 years, and they're being brought back in and retested and redeployed in the COPD gene study. And so far, my understand, all the devices come in and they're they're still working as if they're brand new. Um, uh, and they're tested with DLCO simulators um, to check the accuracy and precision of the device as well. And uh, they're all coming in spot on on terms of simulator testing as well. So they appear to be having long-term stability and accuracy mm -hmm. uh, in the COPD gene study. And um, I think the, uh, the primary investigators in the COPD gene study are extremely pleased with the performance. Uh, the low downtime and, uh, and and the measurement quality. Absolutely. And if anyone on here is interested in seeing that this paper, or um, please email Jamie and I. We're on these slides, and we'll be doing a follow-up email with you. But we can definitely help you. Might be something to take to those physicians. But I can see another question that said, "Is DLCO testing something that can be used for CF patients?" Was that CS patients? CF, cystic yeah. fibrosis. Yeah, yes, definitely. It's used uh, in a number of cases to follow uh, progression of disease and exacerbation of uh, symptoms in CF patients. Okay. Um, in pediatrics with restrictive diseases, is there a value for DLCO? Uh, can we get on that question? Sorry, in pediatrics with restrictive diseases, is there a value for DLCO? Uh, most likely, but there's uh, the problem with pediatrics and DLCO is that there are not good normal values. There are some, and I, I think that, uh, as always, uh, kids have these growth spurts, and uh, pulmonary values are typically linked to their uh, overall height and their growth, which makes uh, general assumptions about the, the predicted value so a little bit harder to make when the kids are changing so fast. Okay, absolutely. So caution. Yeah. Caution, yeah. Perfect, I have one other question here. Um, do you think the cost of a DLCO holds back most family practices um, from spending the money, especially one to two physician offices? Uh, I don't think it should, I think that the reimbursement is considerably higher for DLCO than, than most tests in the family practitioner's office. And uh, I think that the value of the measurement can be quite large uh, in helping the, a family practitioner manage their uh, patients. So um, relatively speaking to, to other costs within small clinics and family practitioner offices, I think it's, uh, it's well justified. Perfect, yeah. thank you. Um, there was one on age, Bob, um, with the studies that you've been a part of. Is there an age that is recommended to start doing DLCO testing? Mm. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to say uh, probably from what I've experienced is with, down to around six to eight years old, right at mm -hmm. that age. But again, it becomes difficult to interpret the data because kids grow at so many different rates and they're at different heights at the same age and so forth. So doing DLCO is uh, is becoming more common all the time. And I think within uh, a very short period of time, we're gonna have a better set of reference equations for younger people. Okay. And there was a question with everything going on with COVID-19 and we're obviously seeing papers starting on the effects of the ARD on the R ARDS of, on patients. How do you think DLCO will help um, in the future of once we get through this COVID-19 epidemic? Uh, well, already, I, you know, I've been asked by several groups to look at studying the, the long-term outcome of patients that survived the COVID-19. Um, apparently short term, there is some uh, decrease in lung function. And I think the hope is that we follow this and it resolves, or at least we'll understand that there are 
long-term uh, damage to the lungs from this uh, virus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think it would be something that will become more and more u more readily used sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Uh, back to the exercise with DLCO testing. Do you recommend that patients do exercise before DLCO, or is it just something that can affect DLCO if it's done? Oh, typ typically, no exercise is recommended prior to mm -hmm. making a DLCO measurement because um, it, it'll increase the value and, and give you basically a falsely high value relative to what we would uh, want to compare to a normal range or a reference value. Okay. Mario, I hope that answered your question. Um, there are some papers I know out there that have done the effects of exercise with DLCO, but I know it's not recommended for if a patient's coming in for a PFT. Right. Right. Um, Bianca, am I missing any? Sorry, I'm trying to. There's a couple more. I mean, we have three that I have open. I could ask those. Yeah, and go then ahead. we could always, um, we have everyone's email also, so we can continue asking questions that way. But I have a question here. So any patient coming in with shortness of breath, the DLCO will help determine if it is the heart or the lungs. So everyone should be tested with a DLCO test, not just spirometry. What document support supports this claim to show the physician the benefit of investing in DLCO? Um. I think there's a number of publications that address this, and I think that uh, maybe Darren and uh, Jamie and uh -huh. Bianca, mm -hmm. you can collate uh, like two or three of the key publications uh -huh. that, yeah. that show the benefit of measuring and differentiating between uh, cardiac and pulmonary with DLCO. Yes, definitely. Um. Perfect. Just two other questions here. One from Michelle. How would we get a practice or group of practices to see the benefit of moving from spirometry patients to DLCO? Um, I guess we read some of the, the current literature. Uh, I think the, right. the paper that COPTG uh, published in CHEST recently is a pretty strong advocate. Uh, the abstract that was submitted to the ATS, which I think will be available, talking about mortality, a uh, very strong association with mortality and uh, DLCO. Um, and I think there's a, also a number of publications that talk about exercise limitations when DLCO is lowered and that DLCO amongst all pulmonary function measurements changes earliest as the lungs are damaged via smoking or other disease processes. So it's it's the early uh, bellwether that tells us something's going on uh, with the lungs, as opposed to spirometry, which, can, which is a late changing parameter. Absolutely, and I'm gonna throw a little question into that too, Bob. There's been uh, talk about that DLCO could be an early predictor when spirometry is normal, but the DLCO's decrease, that could be an early indication for ILD or emphysema. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Because it, it it changes earlier than than the ventilation does. The ventilation can remain perfectly normal, where gas transfer starts to undergo uh, significant changes. Absolutely. So that's a different another point, strong point to take. If you are on here and finding ways to discuss with your physicians as why adding DLCO, um, that's another great indication is that DLCOs can pick up on lung disease before even the spirometry can, like Bob said. Dr. Jensen said, sorry. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And we have one final question here, guys, um, from Scotty here. Do you think family practice is intimidated um, about DLCO? A lot are not even doing spirometry. And also, why doesn't the DOT do DLCO? Uh, I don't know about the DOT. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm. I'm, I'm working with the Veterans Administration right now on a very large study, and they're extremely interested in doing PFTs uh, on, on vets. So it's, uh, it's a very high priority, at least in some segments of the government. Um, uh, the first part of that question was? Sure. Uh, just specifically uh, with family practice, do you think that family practice is intimidated about DLCO, and a lot of them aren't even doing spirometry? Uh, well, I sort of uh, make the analogy that 
uh, a long time ago, automobiles were very difficult to drive. They had all these levers on the wheel and all these different things, and you had to be able to do all sorts of amazing things to make an automobile go. And you typically had to hire a driver to drive you around because they knew how to drive it. It was so complex. And um, they became simpler over time and automated and all the little things that make a, an engine run smoothly and go forward. And now cars can be driven by virtually anybody. Mm -hmm. And right. DLCO, I, I've seen it evolve from the 80s all the way up to now. And it really was when we had, uh, you know, anesthesia bags that we were filling and, and turning valves by hand and trying to calibrate uh, helium analyzers and CO analyzers with elaborate techniques. It was, it was extremely difficult. And today, as you just saw in this demonstration, mm -hmm. it is, uh, it's like driving a modern car. You just put your mouth right. on the mouthpiece, take a breath, <laughs> hold it and blow it out. All the work's done for you. All the calibration, all of the measurements, all the calculations. It has become easier to do than spirometry by far. Agreed. Absolutely. Wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And again, uh -huh. you guys are more than welcome to email us. Um, our emails are on this page or reach out to mm -hmm. us. We'll do a follow up with uh, our questions as well and with a video. So if you missed any part of this, you can listen to us again. Um, but thank you, Dr. Robert Jensen, for yes. jumping on with thank us. Thank you. Yeah, well, we nice really to be here. Thank you for having me today. And, uh, uh, I, I think you guys could, if there were any specific questions to me, then please forward them on and I'll try to handle those. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just keep an eye out for that post-webinar email. Um, in the meantime, you can uh, email us with any questions, visit the website for more specific product details. Um, you know, I know everybody's kind of in the same boat um, being at home, but uh, we do have capability um, to virtually get to you guys if you do need product demonstration or want your questions answered a little more thoroughly um, by one of our NDD reps. So we hope to hear from you all soon. Everybody stay safe. Yes, and stay healthy. Please, please stay home, stay safe, and we will see you guys next month.